Well, good morning. I trust everyone's having a blessed Sabbath morning. It's a little gray out, but uh, it's still a good day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. And we are with family. We are a family. And you know what's beautiful about really all churches, but what's beautiful about the Seventh-day Adventist denomination or movement or church is the fact that our family extends beyond the borders of this local congregation. Throughout the Carolinas, throughout the Southeast, throughout the United States, and throughout the world. You have brothers and sisters all around the world that believe like you, worship like you, that are waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, sometimes it's easy, though, to forget that we go beyond the borders of this church. It's an important thing that we are here. I mean, obviously our greatest responsibility is within these walls and the responsibilities we have to this community, but there's so much more. And so today, what I want to do is I want to talk about that structure that's been given to us, that we have been blessed with, that enables us to not just be a local congregation in the batesburg Leesville area, but to be uh, an a presence throughout the world, and you play a role in that. Sitting in your seat today, you play a role not only in the local community, but also in the worldwide one. And I want to share with that with you this morning. So if you would, join with me in prayer one more time. Father in heaven, again, thank you, Lord, for this a beautiful Sabbath morning. I thank you for the opportunity to stand before my family. And I ask for your spirit and your wisdom to guide me, to guide my words, that I may do justice to the thoughts you've given to me this week, that I may clearly communicate what you've given. But above and beyond what my weak words can communicate, I pray that your spirit speaks to all of our hearts the things you know us, that all of us need to hear. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I would like to begin uh, by looking at the Gospel Commission. These are the words Jesus offers at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. He is speaking to the disciples. He is giving them their mission that they are to carry out until he returns. And of course, Jesus has not returned yet. So this mission that was given to them also falls to us. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. So he says, our mission is to make disciples of all nations, not just the United States, not just Europe, not just Africa, not just the Middle East, but all nations. We have a worldwide commission. We talk about baptisms and teaching. That's all a part of discipling people to follow Jesus Christ. That is our mission. It is a worldwide mission. We are called the Three Angels Seventh-day Adventist Church. That is our name because it's based upon the Three Angels message that Seventh-day Adventists stand for. The First Angels message tells us that the gospel is going to go to the world. Notice Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So again, the first angel's message says the gospel is to go to the world, to every nation. We have a worldwide mission, right? The third angel's message is what we like to talk about a lot, but the reality is the third angel's message don't make sense without the second and the first. The gospel is a global worldwide mission. Here is a statement from Ellen White in Acts of the Apostles, chapter one, page one. She says, the church is God's appointed agency for what? the salvation of men. It was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world, his fullness and his sufficiency. And so the church's purpose is to bring the gospel to the world. It is the agency to accomplish the salvation of Men. It says it was organized for service. Sometimes you'll hear that churches are service organizations. That's not entirely true. We are not organized just for service alone. You know, there's different ministries. There's food ministries and there's clothing ministries, but we're not organized just for those services as an end. 
right? As to the whole purpose. The whole purpose is the gospel. We must spread the gospel. We must help people to understand Jesus is coming and their world, their lives are to be transformed. And as a result, we are organized for service in that manner. The ministries we do are to share the love of Jesus Christ in the character so those needs can be met. They can understand the bigger picture. We have a worldwide mission and message. Now, what's interesting is, do you know that in the early 1900s, Ellen White called for reorganization of the denomination? And what she was asking for is, by our movement officially came into existence in 1863. That's when we decided to organize ourselves as a denomination, 1863. By the late 1890s, the early 1900s, the denomination was primarily a North American entity. We were trying to do mission work in other parts of the world and had been, but we noticed that the structure of the church was organized such a, in such a way that it was only benefiting the United States. And the majority of finances and money that was coming from the, the members was in the United States. And she realized that if we continued in that way, we would never be able to bring the message to the rest of the world. So we needed to restructure. We needed to reorganize. And that was done in her lifetime. Sometimes people will bring up those quotes and say, oh, you shouldn't trust in the denomination. Look, she didn't even have faith in it. People will do that kind of thing. Well, the call she made was answered. And they did reorganize it, and we are the beneficiaries of it today. In fact, the structure we have is a result of that effort to reorganize the way we think and the way we act so that we can serve across the board. So what I want to do is I would like to look at the structure of how our denomination uh, is ordered or structured. And I hope this is not dry and boring. I want this to be exciting and purposeful. I want you to understand that this is an amazing structure that we are a part of. So it begins with you here in the local church. We are the Batesburg, Leesville, Three Angels, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, But you as a church are networked with other churches across the Carolinas. And that is called the Conference. We are a part of the Carolina Conference. That's all of the Seventh-day Adventist churches in North Carolina and South Carolina networked together in a conference. Okay? And there's a number of things we'll talk about, the benefits and the services that that provides. But the rest of the world is divided into churches and conferences as well. You can take those conferences and network them together in what is called a union. So we are a part of the Southern Union. So the Carolina Conference, in addition to the Georgia Cumberland Conference and, and the South Atlantic and the Florida Cumberland, I'm sorry, Florida and Georgia Cumberland and Kentucky, Tennessee, we come together as the Southern Union. But the rest of the world is organized in churches, conferences, and unions. All of those unions are networked together in what we call the division. We are a part of the North American division. So all of the unions in North America come together under the North American division. So whenever you see in our bulletin it says NAD, that's North American division. That's the unity of all of the churches, conferences, and unions in North America. But of course, the rest of the world is organized into divisions as well. Those divisions network together in what is called the general conference. That's the worldwide network uh, of Adventist, Adventism functioning together. Now, there are about 21 million members worldwide. Now, that's what we can count. There is ministry going on in parts of the world that uh, they cannot talk about publicly because it's illegal to spread Christianity in some of those places. So what we call that is the, the church underground it's not technically underground, it's just an expression to mean that they can't talk about it publicly. So in certain portions of the Middle East, certain countries, uh, it is illegal to proselytize, it is illegal to be a Christian. And so in those remote regions, uh, they don't publicize that they're Christians, but they're work worshiping secretly or in, in hiding and things of that nature. So the number that are on the books is 21 million. You are part of a family that is at least, by number, 21 million members worldwide. And that is an incredible and a powerful thing. Now, let's focus on you. Let's focus on all of us sitting here in this church. 
how do we impact this local church as well as the global community? Well, there's a lot of different ways, but just to simplify it, I want to talk about finances because finances is a very simple way that you impact this local community and the global one. And it is created that way based on the structure. So I want to talk about tithes and offerings. We mentioned the children's story, tithes and offerings. Now, I'm oversimplifying a tiny bit, but just to kind of clarify this in your mind, tithes are 10% of your income, and it affects primarily ministry outside of your local church. Offerings, I have a question mark there because there's no percentage mark based on offering. It can be as much as you want it to be. Some people give 3% offering. Some people give another 10 on top of the tithe. Some could get even more. It's, it's up to you. God requires 10% to be returned in tithes, but offering is uh, up to you. Now, understand those two are different. Tithe is different than offerings. Sometimes people confuse the two, or they give tithe as offering, as offering as tithe. But the reality is they are two separate entities, and they are used in a different capacity in our denomination. They're both biblical concepts, but tithe primarily impacts the ministry outside and goes to the world, whereas your offerings primarily are locally based. Now, as we talked about today, there are offerings that begin given that go to the union, that go to the conference, that go to the North American division. But when you pay tithe, the, the things that are paid for in this local church and this local ministry, they're not paid through the tithe. That comes about through your offering. When the tithe is collected, it is sent off to the Carolina conference. So the tithe that is collected in all the churches across the world is then sent to their local conference, and then the ministers are paid equally through that, okay? And now there's certain adjustments based on cost of living. You know, if you're a pastor that lives in D.C., Washington, D.C., you know, the cost of housing is like, you know, a house that, that maybe is 150000 here is 580000 in D.C. So they will make adjustments with cost of living, but essentially all the ministers in the Adventist church were paid equally across the board with cost of living adjustments. And that is created to make sure that we have coverage across all of our churches. You know, there is a, there is a structure in many churches that is called congregationalism. Now, congregationalism is something that um, if you were a Baptist or you are a Baptist, your church structure is congregationalist. What does that mean? It means all of your resources stay in the local congregation. It doesn't go out beyond your borders. So that has pluses and minuses, right? Uh, for the 30-member Baptist church who has a pastor, unless those 30 members are millionaires, that pastor more than likely has another job or two while he is pastoring. Uh, but the church that's the you know, 2,000 member one that it's on TV that everybody knows and your local important people go to, that pastor probably makes six figures and they probably have two or three other pastors on board. Okay, And it's because of the finances. But in our denomination, we wanted to make sure the mission and the ministry was worldwide. And so that's why the tithe is collected and sent off and ministry is done in that particular way. Now, the offerings, the offerings, those are, are primarily here, as I said. So let's, let's do a little exercise. I'd like you to grab your tithe envelope. Uh, there should be one in the, in the uh, chair in front of you. And uh, you can look at your electronic one online. We have online giving, too. That, that applies. But essentially, you know, there's a little area there to fill out your personal information. And that's helpful just because... We want you to communicate to us where you want your money to go, okay? So if you just put money in as a loose offering or you put money in the envelope but don't indicate what it's for, our treasurer doesn't know what to count that as. Is that your tithe? Is that your offering? What is it? Where do you want it to go? Um, and so sometimes there are certain offerings that are given. If you give uh, loose money, you just throw 20 in the offering plate, that goes to whatever cause that's dedicated for. So if, if you really wanted some project here in the church, that $20 to go to, but you didn't indicate it, and you put it in the offering plate uh, as loose offering, that money can go to whatever the loose offering is for that month. So we want you to understand 
indicate where your money, where you want your money to go, okay? So that's helpful to our finance staff, our, our treasurer, and, and everyone so that you're being more intentional with your money. So right under your personal information says tithe. Of course, indicate how much of that check is tithe, how much of that you want that to go to tithe, and we've talked about that here. Then underneath that is local church. And so we've got the church budget, uh, building fund, church expenses, uh, and Sabbath school expenses. And then you've got some other categories here in your that are, that are taped on here. Evangelism, evangelism ministry, um, pastoral fund, and uh, the 777 radio. Okay, so those are all areas that you can give to locally that are ministries that impact this local church, right? Our 7-7 radio and a number of other things. Those are directly responsible for us ministering to people in this community. So when you put your check in there, write how much you want to go to whatever ministry you're dedicating yourself to. Now, understand church budget is kind of the general account where we use to pay the major bills that need to be paid. So when in doubt, if you don't have a ministry of choice that you want to dedicate something to, just, just put it in combined budget, and then the church, it will generally get to where it needs to. Or another one that's like that is the church expense, which is kind of like a reserve account. So sometimes if there's uh, unexpected expenses that are not covered, you know, if there's damages that are not covered by insurance and we have to do repairs and things like that, we can pull that out of church expense. So just understand when in doubt, church expense or combined budget. But if you have an intentional ministry you want to give to, indicate what you want it to go to and, and write it there. And of course, underneath there, there's uh, conference ministries that you can donate to and world church ministries, and those will be sent off appropriately. But my point is that I just want you to be intentional with where you want your money to go, to communicate that to us. It's beneficial to us and beneficial uh, to you. But understand the tithe you give goes beyond the walls of this church and benefits ministry far beyond these borders. And that is an incredible blessing. So when you visit other churches in the conference, when you visit other churches in the union, in the division, in the world, understand that our system has been created so that we stand together as a family. And it's a beautiful, beautiful structure. So you benefit the world church as well as the local one through your tithes and offerings. So don't minimize the importance of what that does. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the different benefits uh, that come through this structure of the church. We're going to begin with the local here, okay? You and your local church. Now, I really don't need to go into great detail, but I just I like to reemphasize how important it is. So... We jumped ahead here. Let's see. You and the local church. So some churches will have a church school, right, which can be kindergarten through eighth. They feel Christian education is important. Adventist education is important. And so they will have a school. A school is beneficial to educate your kids in, in the Adventist education, and it, but it can also be used as outreach. I know schools that advertise outside the community, and they get a lot of non-Adventists sending their kids to Adventist schools because they want a high-level Christian education. And even though they're not Adventist, they want to send their kids there. I have friends of mine who are from India, and in Sri Lanka, many of the people... Uh, went to Adventist schools and Adventist hospitals because the Adventists were there creating those entities. And so many of the local people that were not tied to Adventism at all were benefited through their education through the hospital systems and are Adventists as a result of it today. So those services that were organized for can benefit us in ministry. Of course, worship is an important part of the local church. Right? We impact people through the worship service. I mean, now you say, well, but pastor, worship isn't about evangelism. Worship is about worshiping God, and it is, right? It's about us connecting with God. But it's not just that. It's also about us connecting with each other, isn't it? The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. If God just wanted us to worship by ourselves, the modern age would be perfect. We wouldn't even have to come to church. We could just watch this on YouTube and not have to see another single human being for the rest of our lives. But the Bible says not to forsake the assembling together of ourselves. Why does he want us to come together as a community and worship God in the same space? So we could be with each other. 
so we could minister to each other. We realize we're part of a community, and that's a powerful thing. And as a result, sometimes you get strangers that just wander in off the street. And why are they here? I don't know. Maybe God is leading you to ask them a question. Hey, I'm Jeff. What's your name? We're glad to have you. What brings you here? Engage with them. Invite them to fellowship meal. I tell you, we spend a lot of money on evangelism to do meetings, to reach outside our borders, and that's important. But there are a lot of people that wander into our churches on Sabbath morning that God is just waiting for us to look up from our hymnals and notice and befriend and engage them. Uh, God has blessed. There was a, a gentleman at one of my churches uh, several years ago before the pandemic. He just showed up at our church one Sabbath and we asked him, what brought you here? And he said, well, I'm a nurse at a nearby nursing home. And I had this theological question, and I was asking this other nurse, and we got into this discussion. And she said, you sound like you're a Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, what's a Seventh-day Adventist? So he Googled us, and he showed up at our church. A year later, he was running our sound system as one of our baptized members because people loved him and engaged him and welcomed him in the community. I mean, what happens on Sabbath morning is an incredible form of evangelism. But the goal is you're not trying to convert people on Sabbath morning. You're just trying to relate to people. You're trying to aid them in the journey that God is bringing them on, just like we've all been a part of that journey. If we think back long enough, some of us, it's a long time ago, right? How God led us and how God used us and unlikely, unlikely circumstances. So don't put pressure on people. Don't, you know, it's not a hard sell. You're just happy to see people. You engage with them and realize they're on a journey, we're on a journey, we want to be journeying together. And of course, the fellowship meal potluck, which we do, is an important extension of that as well. A friend of mine moved to another conference several years back, and I was in contact with, with the young lady, and I said, have you found a new church yet? And she says, yeah, but I don't know. It's uh, She's, I said, what, what's going on? She said, well, you know, you show up for Sabbath morning. Nobody says hello to you in the foyer. Uh, there was a greeter. They just kind of coldly hand you a bulletin. Everybody sat down. Nobody talked to each other. Everybody was stone-faced. She said, as soon as the service was over, everybody made a beeline for the door, jumped in their cars, and drove off. And she's like, I had to use the restroom. And they kind of yelled at me that I was holding everybody up from locking the door. And she said, it was the most unfriendly experience I've ever been to at a church. And she says, I'm going to go back and give it a few more tries. But she said, if, if this, I don't know, I, I don't feel real comfortable, right? That church was missing precious opportunities. Our church had sent a precious soul who was growing in her faith, and she was looking for a church, but the church was turning her away at every opportunity, right? And so we need to understand the importance you have in the local church to impact people, to invite people, to love them, to be on the lookout for visitors, to engage with them. God is, you know, when God brings people to the church, he is doing a work in their lives, and that's what we need to recognize, right? And we're just partnering with him in that. Uh, Sometimes churches have gymnasiums uh, and various forms of community outreach. Sometimes uh, ministry can be done through, you know, having a gym. You know, different churches do different things, uh, community outreach. But there are so many ways that the local church impacts uh, the community. One of our churches, we have a food bank distribution. We work with the, uh, the Golden Harvest Food Bank there in Aiken County, and we distribute. Now, much of the help that we give in that food bank doesn't directly tie in or translate into baptisms, but that's okay because we're still showing the love of Jesus. We're not doing it just to get baptism. Do you understand? We're doing it because we love people. We're doing it because we're ministering to people, and I want that to be an important thing too because we live in a transactional uh, world where people seem to only do nice things for you because they're looking for a response, right? They're looking for a payback. Uh, and so I think as, as God's people, as as people of Christ, we need to do ministry like he did. There were people Jesus healed and helped that turned around and went the other direction and never came back. And you know what? That's okay. Because we didn't do the ministry because we were expecting a transactional response, right? We do it because we love people. And we know that God is leading and guiding. And so that's what ministry is all about. But again, we're more than just the local church. The churches all connect together in a conference, the Carolina Conference. And so there are many things that the Carolina Conference provides. And so one of them was, was spoken about here today during our offering, which is our campground, Nasoka Pines Ranch. And so there are summer camps. 
you know, thank you, Janice, because you, you just gave a, a, an important part of the service that I don't need to talk about specifically. I mean, the, the summer camps are great. They're evangelistic tools because you can get kids from the community that aren't even Adventists. Your own kids get to go and experience that a week with Jesus, but a week of being in nature and experiencing a lot of fun uh, that's there, and it shapes and changes their life uh, for eternity. But that campground is also used in other capacities. Churches can rent that or use that facility uh, for different events um, our workers' meetings, our ministers all gather together twice a year. There's elders' retreats that are held there. So it's used in a, a, a numerous capacities. Uh, we don't currently have a retreat center, but some conferences do. Academies. Uh, academies are basically high schools that are like boarding high schools. And so many church schools will have K through 8, but what do you do with your kids when it's time to go to high school? So our academy is Mount Pisgah, which is in Asheville. And so that is the one that's sponsored through our conference. However, there's also a non-conference sponsored one in the Carolinas uh, called uh, Fletcher. And so those are two different boarding academies that, uh, that Adventists can send their kids to. And again, they're committed to Adventist education. We've talked about pastors. Uh, evangelism is a big thing. Carolina gets a lot of money uh, donated for Carolina evangelism. They push, hey, we need to evangelize. We need to do meetings throughout the year. And so from those resources, they benefit us because the conference itself isn't doing evangelistic meetings. They're doing it through us. So if we do an evangelistic meeting, we can send off to them, say, hey, we're going to do this six-week series. This is our budget. Can you help out? And they will, they will donate a certain amount of money, give us money from, from that account because they care about us doing evangelism. So again, we have support more than just what this local church can raise. We can benefit from members across the Carolinas that give to Carolina evangelism. Also, I want to touch on trust services. I went too far there. Trust services, uh, last will and testaments and trusts. Like you can go to a lawyer and get those get those filled out. You have to pay for that. If you were a member of the Carolina Conference, they provide trust and will services free of charge. So if you don't have a last will and testament, I would recommend you get one. Uh, you know, you can obviously specify where your possessions go, if anything happens to you, what you want donated, um, you know, issues with medical issues, if you end up becoming incapacitated in an accident, whether you want to be resuscitated or not, all that can be in this document. The Carolina Conference does it free of charge for you. So all we need to do is contact the conference, and Rick Hutchins, who's in charge of that, he'll arrange something. Uh, he'll come down, visit with whoever wants to do it. We could set up a time here at the church, uh, maybe like a Sunday morning or whatever's convenient for church members and anybody who wants to go, he will schedule appointments and do that. That's a free service offered by the Carolina Conference. It's a benefit to you for being a member here. Okay. Let's look at the union. Uh, now, these are all the different uh, conferences that are connected. The South Atlantic, Georgia Cumberland, I went through them all already. What does the union do? Well, the union supports our universities. So Southern Adventist University that is in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, that is supported by the Southern Union. And each of the universities we have, we have quite a few around the United States. We have several around the world as well. Uh, but the ones that are in the United States, we've got Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas. We've got um, Pacific Union College in California, Walla Walla in Washington, Andrews in Michigan. There, there's, a, there's a slew of them. But they're supported by the union level. Of course, Religious liberty is next on the list. I don't need to tell you folks about the benefits of religious liberty, right? We've all been impacted. That was something that if we'd been faced with that and wanted to hire a lawyer, right, we didn't have to pay the Southern Union anything to have Amir al-Haddad come and help us, talk with us, arrange uh, legal counsel from the North American Division. All of that came through this level, through the Union, through the Southern Union. So that's another additional blessing that we had access to uh, because of this connection that we have as Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, we've got the revolving fund, which is a, um, basically a, an account that uh, churches, if you're going to build building projects, you can borrow from this, and, um, and so it, it's a benefit to us. Education, Southern Tidings, which is this magazine, home health education services, internet technologies, Native American ministries, and evangelism are just some of the things. Um, Division. Let's look at the North American Division. This is a nice little map of all the different uh, conference, um, the unions that make up the North American Division. 
The division, North American division, is responsible for media ministries. There's a lot of Adventists today and things, ministries like that. Uh, the seminary. Now, I said the universities were covered under the union, but the seminary is kind of a special division of the uh, university in Michigan, Andrews University. So what is the seminary? The seminary is the graduate degree uh, to train pastors. You get the Master of Divinity there. So you can go to Southern Adventist University and you can get a, a Bachelor of Arts in Theology, okay, which puts you on track to being a pastor. But if you need to get the additional education, you have to go to Andrews to get the Master's degree. They call that the seminary. So it's a special division of the university at Andrews, and that's covered and supported under the North American division. Sabbath school resources, retirement plans, evangelism, publishing houses, review and herald, and things of that nature are covered under the division. And then finally, we have the General Conference, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, your brothers and sisters worldwide. And so this covers missionaries. There are General Conference-sponsored missionaries that are sent to different strategic parts of the world to do missionary work. Of course, you may know of independent missionaries and that, that you know, are done in different ministries, um, but and those are all good too, but just through the General Conference, we have specifically funded missionaries that go to strategic parts uh, to do certain types of, of work. I met one that was uh, involved in the Middle East some years ago into those areas that's very, very difficult to do ministry. And uh, to listen to the stories of how God led and used him was, was incredible. Evangelism, Adventist World Radio, you know, you hear AWR, Adventist World Radio, that is something that helps us send the Adventist message into homes of people when they're living in countries where it's illegal to be Christians. It's illegal to listen to these messages, but they can listen to the Adventist message secretly in their home through Adventist World Radio, and that is through the General Conference. Uh, Adventist Development and Relief Agency, we call it ADRA where there are disasters around the world, and even in the U.S., the ADRA, Adventist Development Relief Agency, arrives and provides support and help and organization. Now, when I first joined the Adventist Church 20-some years ago, I said I'd never heard of ADRA, and I'd heard of the Red Cross. In the years following being an Adventist, I've heard a lot more about ADRA. Uh, ADRA has been present when we had the hurricanes on the coast in North Carolina and other areas, but primarily Outside of the United States, ADRA is known, is more well known than, than the Red Cross is outside the United States. But this is an arm of the General Conference Adventist Development Relief Agency. So when people say, why don't, why don't Christians, why doesn't your church help when there's natural disasters and all kinds of problems? We are. We're there. ADRA is present. Uh, Global Mission, Sabbath School Quarterly, and the Adventist Review are all uh, through the General Conference. So... Again, understand that you are responsible for this local congregation here at Three Angels, at the Batesburg, uh, Leesville community. But through your effort and through your influence and through your tithe dollars, you support ministry that goes to the Carolina Conference, that goes to the Southern Union, that goes to the North American Division, that goes to the General Conference. And you are part of a worldwide family and brotherhood. And that's amazing. And that's, I encourage you. I mean, we need you here in this local community. But when you have the opportunity, go visit some of your brothers and sisters in other churches, in other conferences. If you're traveling, stop into the Adventist church there. It's funny because they use the same Sabbath school quarterly. They're studying the same kind of things. If you go to a foreign country, that Sabbath school quarterly may be written in a different language, but it's the same Sabbath school quarterly you're studying, studying over here. And there's just such a sense of feeling and connection that you have to be able to go to a foreign country and stop in to an Adventist church and realize you believe the same, right? Your focus is the same in Jesus in the second coming. And I want to finish with this story. When I first joined the Adventist church, I went on a short-term mission trip to Romania. And we were there for about, uh, about a month. And we were just, we were partnering with a local Romanian Adventist pastor and his family, and they had already two areas of ministry that they were working out through the conference and the, and the union that was over there. And they said, we want your American church to go and, and minister in these areas. And so we did. And so we did, you know, one portion was preaching, another was teaching English, another was uh, medical exams. And, and so 
we were doing that as organized service to benefit the work that the church there in Romania was already doing, right? We weren't Americans just going and starting something. We were partnering with the work that God was already doing with those people. But one of the things that was fascinating was I wanted to learn Romanian, or at least as much as I could going over there. Now, Romania is not considered sort of a destination country, right? And the Romanians knew that at that time. Like, people didn't typically try to learn Romanian. They would try to learn French, or they'd try to learn, you know, some country they wanted to visit. So they kind of understood they were, they were kind of looked down upon. But when I, as American, said, I've been trying to learn your language, oh, that just endeared me to their hearts. And they're in the Adventist family there, the pastor's family, there was this young pastor's daughter, she's about 15, and... She loved the fact that I was trying to learn, and so she was helping as much. And so we developed a pretty good friendship. Well, fast forward several years later, I'm back in America, and I go to Doug Batchelor's AFCO in 2000. So I'm in Sacramento Central, the big church there, 2,000 members, and I'm in their training program, and I haven't talked to, to her in years. One day, I'm walking out of the church sanctuary. Somebody needed my help, so church was still going on, but I'm walking out of the church sanctuary, and Doug's church is so big. If you've ever been there, I mean, you could literally, you and I, if we did not plan to be, didn't know we were both going to be there, we could be there and then miss each other on that day because the church is so big, you might not cross paths with one another. And so I happened to be walking out, and I heard, psst, psst, and I look over, and there are like 20 people away in the row. There she was. There was Andrea. And... It was just this great reunion. She's like, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in South Carolina. I says, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in Romania. But we had this connection through Adventism, through our message, partnering together, working side by side with each other. And that's why, you know, we are a worldwide family. That's why it, the, the very last baptismal vow says we welcome people of uh, all races, nations, languages, and tongues to be a part of the Adventist fellowship. Right, Because we're all a part of the people of God committed in this message and this movement. So I want you to understand that you are a part of a big family and you have an important role to play in your presence, in your love, and in your finances as well. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you for this blessing of this incredibly large family that is increasingly growing. Lord, we know that you are coming soon. We can see the telltale signs in the world all around us. And Lord, while those signs are frightening on a worldly perspective, we also are reminded that you are in control. And they remind us that you are growing uh, ever near to your arrival. So Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us in this local community to do our part, to impact the people. But also through our finances, realize that we're impacting not only this community, but the Adventist world, the Adventist family beyond our borders. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into this fellowship. Thank you for using us, Lord, in far greater ways than we could have ever imagined. Bless us and this congregation, these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.